going to look at how do you provide the infrastructure for safe drinking water in developing nations worldwide. And we have uh, Dr. Craig Adams coming up from University of Missouri Rolla. So we hope you can come out here for that. Also, next year we're going to be sending out announcements via email for the science seminar and other programs such as this at the Academy of Science Sponsors. If you're interested in receiving eBlast next year, pretty much for these types of programs, not to sell you a membership or anything like that, feel free on the way out to sign up on the mailing list that's at the front welcome desk. So with that, I'd like to turn it over to Mary Burke, the Executive Director of the Academy of Science. Thanks, Jim. Um, I also wanted to mention that if you were here last month, um, we mentioned that we were having a special um, over at a presentation over at Maryville College in February. It was supposed to have been last Tuesday night. And it was on global warming, a, a screening of an inconvenient truth and a panel. And because of climate issues, um, we had to cancel it. So that has been rescheduled for March the 15th. That's Thursday, March the 15th at 7 o'clock um, at Maryville University. Um, no charge. And if you pull into the parking lot, you'll see where the, there'll be signs up. Um, if anyone is interested in, go, in finding out more about that or any of the other Academy of Science um, programs that we have, you can go to the website academyofsciencestl.org and we've got our propaganda out there on the table too. Um, thank you all very much for coming. We are thrilled to have with us Dr. Tiffany Knight, Assistant Professor of Biology with Washington University. The title, as you may have noticed for the seminar series this year, was Collaborative Genius. Tapping Creativity in Science, and um, Dr. Knight is an excellent example of someone who collaborates all across the spectrum. And um, join me in welcoming Dr. Knight. Okay. So thank you very much for inviting me to speak today. And today I'm going to focus mostly on alien invasions. And something that's happening recently right now is that we are moving around the world at a faster rate than ever before. We're much more connected as people than ever before. And what I'm showing here is Earth, and uh, all the major airports are the dots. And so you can see that as humans we're very connected, and we're also moving organisms around at alarming rates. So this causes organisms to be moved to places where they're not native, and so they're alien. Um, aliens are a species that does not naturally occur in an area. Uh, some of these aliens then become invasive, and the, inv the real distinction there is an invasive alien is one that causes economic or environmental harm, or harm to human health. And I'm going to start with, a, with an example from the island of Guam. Uh, where the brown tree snake is, is a pretty nasty invader. So the brown tree snake is not native to Guam, it's native to Australia. So how did a tree snake get from Australia to Guam? Well, if you saw the movie, <laughs> Snakes on a Plane, uh, then it's pretty obvious how, how, how snakes would, would travel from one country to another. Um, and this is actually what happened with the brown tree snake. Uh, maybe not as dramatic, but uh, they, they did get into cargo planes uh, that frequently travel from Guam, where the United States has a military base, to all over the world. So these snakes travel on the plane, they get into the cargo, they get off in Guam, and they find themselves in an environment without their native predators, which are monitor lizards in Australia. So they have no native predators, and there are no other snakes on Guam. There are no native snakes on Guam. So these snakes find themselves being the only snake in a predator-free area. And they also find themselves with lots of naive birds available for them to eat. And this has been devastating. Um, there have been six species of Guam birds that have gone extinct. Uh, so, so this is certainly a, an alien species that's had a significant environmental impact, a negative environmental impact 
on the bird communities there. There's also been an economic impact of the brown tree snake. In addition to the economic impact of just trying to get rid of the brown tree snake because they don't want it there for the environmental reasons, uh, the brown tree snake, in addition to climbing trees, will also get tangled in electrical wire wires and take down electrical wires. There's a power outage somewhere in Guam every three days due to a brown tree snake. And so this causes significant economic costs for the electric companies there, and it's caused a cost to their tourism industry. So, so a horrible example. Here's one um, that's in our backyard. This is here in the United States, kudzu. Kudzu is not uh, native to the United States, it's native to Asia. It's been introduced, it was introduced as an ornamental plant um, because it has really nice fo foliage and, and flowers, and it's able to grow pretty fast, but it's become really aggressive. And so you can see with this car here, which has only been there about two weeks unattended, and this is the kudzu growing over it. So it's able to grow at really alarming rates of a foot a day. Um, and here it is, there, there's actually a house in this picture. If you can see it right there. So you can imagine the environmental impact is pretty obvious in that not many other species can obviously coexist with such an aggressive plant. And uh, it's, it's, it's moving into natural areas, agricultural areas. Um, it's just really terrible. And this is all over the southeastern United States now. Zebra mussels. So zebra mussels are native to Europe, to lakes in Europe. They came over here in the ballasts of ships, and then the ships released their ballast once they arrived to our Great Lakes. And the zebra mussel escapes, becomes established. And you can see just how dense they're able to get with this shopping cart down here. Uh, which was left in a lake and then removed. You can see this completely colonized by zebra mussels. And then native species like this crayfish get colonized by zebra mussels to their detriment. <clears throat> and then it's also, in, in addition to the obvious severe environmental impacts of the zebra mussels, it's also caused economic imp impacts to the power plants, which have pipes that go into these waterways because they get clogged up with mussels and millions to billions of dollars are spent each year to try and um, clear our waterways from zebra mussels and our pipes from the zebra mussels. And this is just showing how rapidly this happened. Um, this is the location of zebra mussels in 1988. They just arrived and were documented in the Great Lakes. This is less than 20 years later. Um, so you can see they've, they've, they're in all of the Great Lakes now, and they've moved through our riverways, and they're right here in, in our backyard in the Mississippi River. Okay, an agricultural pest, uh, or it's a pest in general, but especially to agriculture, is the white fly. The white fly is native to India, but it's been able to establish on every continent except Antarctica. So this is a very widespread organism right now. So what it does is it pierces the plant and it sucks fluid out of it, which is obviously not very good for the plant. But it also can vector over 100 diseases. Uh, so it, it, it sucks fluid out of the plant and then um, diseases it. So it's pretty terrible. Um, and this has been a huge, huge agricultural cost. And it, it, can, um, it can do this to over 600 plant species. Uh, 100 diseases, 600 plant species. And then one that's really relevant to human health is the Asian tiger mosquito. Uh, the Asian tiger mosquito is, is native to Asia. Um, it's here in North America now, and it's capable of vectoring many different diseases, such as dengue, encephalitis, and West Nile virus. And so I'm showing you all these terrible examples of species that have had significant environmental effects, driven native species extinct, and significant economic effects. But, but something, that pe something that people often ask is, well, isn't this natural? I mean, species naturally move around. Maybe they're moving around a little faster now, but they naturally move around. And, and extinction is natural. It's a natural process. Um, and what I would argue is that, yes, species naturally move around, but, but not this fast. Um, the snakes might not have found their way to Guam for a very, very long time. And certainly the zebra mussels would have had a, a very difficult time moving from freshwaters of Europe to the freshwaters of North America. So we're moving these species around at a rate that is just unprecedented and something that would have taken them much longer to do themselves. 
And yes, extinction happens. There's, there's certainly no species that's immortal. Um, but right now we're in the midst of what's called the sixth mass extinction event. Uh, so species are, have had five other mass extinction events uh, where basically if you look at the fossil record, you can see these blips of time periods. And these time periods are usually a million years or more uh, where species went extinct at a rapid rate. Some of these have been correlated with meteors landing on the earth and, and other types of, of really dramatic effects. Um, the last mass extinction event we had was when the dinosaurs went extinct, which was right here. Um, and right now, species are going extinct at a faster rate than when the dinosaurs went extinct. We're losing species faster now. Uh, and so currently, it's estimated that we're losing about 30,000 species per year um, and three species, that comes up to three species an hour. So uh, during the time period where you're sitting here listening to this talk, three species on Earth will go extinct. Um, so this is, I, I think this is very alarming. <clears throat> So, so just to reiterate some of the problems caused by invasive species, and here in the United States, there are 6,500 alien plant species. Not all of those are invasive. Um, in fact, probably one out of every 10, only one out of every 10 is, is truly problematic. We do have a lot of alien um, plant species that are here in animal species. And they're considered the second largest threat now to native species. The first largest threat, the worst thing we can do to native plant species is destroy habitat actually tear down habitat and build up a shopping mall is the worst thing we can do to native species. The second worst, next to, to complete habitat destruction, is to introduce non-native species. That's the second worst thing you can do. So these are having devastating effects. Um, and this is a threat to agriculture and a threat to human health. Um, and right now, the economic losses every year in this country are estimated at $120 billion, of what we're losing by having these invasive plant species here. And just to show one that's a little bit recent is the glass-winged sharpshooter, this insect right here, it, which has just recently invaded California. This is native to the southeastern United States, um, not native to California. And what it's doing is it's vectoring a bacterial disease, um, which causes Pierce's disease. Um, and this is showing grape leaves with the disease. Um, and it's fatal. It will kill the entire grape plants, which for anybody that knows anything about California grapes, it takes a really long time, especially in the wine um, growing industry, for them to, to really be productive. So, so it's very devastating. The disease has been around in California for at least 200 years. Um, but it's never been a big problem because there hasn't been an insect that's been able to vector it very well. However, this insect is. It's able to vector it very well, and it's able to fly long distances, and it's spreading this disease really, really rapidly, really affecting grapes um, and the wine industry. Uh, we lost $41 million last year due to this species. And this is a $5 billion industry that's really um, threatened right now by this invasive insect. So as a scientist, as an ecologist, um, I'm, I, I have to ask, why do species become invasive? Um, which aliens become invasive and why? What allows them to do that? Um, and then there have been several things that we've come up with and that we're still in the process of looking at. Uh, lack of natural enemies, they're evolutionary no evolutionarily novel, they invade already disturbed habitats, and, or they possess invasive traits. So these are just some I'm going to go through. Um, lack of natural enemies. Um, this one is, is often um, suggested and, and has been shown in many cases. So with the brown tree snake, remember when it arrived in Guam, it left behind its natural predators, the monitor lizard, which allowed it to really experience very rapid population growth when, it, when it's having this basically unchecked population growth, and nothing really regulating it. Um, lots of food and no enemies. So that's certainly um, one of the reasons why this species has been able to do so well. Evolutionarily novel. Um, and, and this is another case where the brown tree snake really has an advantage. There are no native snakes in Guam. So it's just a very unique creature. There's nothing like it in the community where, where it's invaded. invade already disturbed habitats. So with the kudzu, um, it's really, it, it tends to start in roadsides and, and, and disturbed areas. So if you think about when we do some sort of disturbance, like when we build a road um, or when we spread nutrients, nutrient runoff from agriculture, any other types of disturbance, we really disrupt our native species and uh, perhaps bring down their diversity and make them less able to, to ward off any new species that enters the community, especially a fast-growing species like kudzu. So certainly if we disturb our habitats, we're making it a lot easier for the invasive species to come in and spread. 
And that seems to be the case with kudzu. But also with kudzu, it possesses invasive traits. So it's predisposed in some ways to becoming invasive. Um, and for example, it's able to grow a foot a day. And it's able to have that rapid growth rate in its native and in its invasive range. So um, it's a fast growing plant that rapidly reproduces. Um, that, that's a trait that tends to make things weedy. And so how do we solve the invasive species problem? Um, and, and I'm going to talk about four things. Pre preventing them from entering in the first place, early detection, understanding how they succeed, and eradication and restoration. So prevent them from entering in the first place. A lot of times we know how these species are getting in. Um, for example, with the zebra mussel, we know that this com it's coming in in ballast water. Right? So people have been working um, to try and prevent, ballast water is full of other organisms besides uh, zebra mussels. So we can try and prevent some of these further organisms which haven't yet established from keep getting, keep getting introduced again and again and again until eventually they will establish. Um, and one way to do that is to boil the water before it's released um, or to have some sort of mechanical removal, some sort of filter the water goes through before it's released. Uh, or to do some sort of chemical um, uh, treatment that will kill all life inside the water. Uh, so, so these are all options that I've been looking into. They're all expensive, um, but might be worthwhile, especially if you consider the economic damages that the, the zebra mussels have imposed. Um, with the, the snakes on the plane, they now have dog, dog sniffing, um, dogs that are sniffing for snakes um, on, for all the cargo planes before they go to Guam. Okay, and that's been pretty successful. Um, with kudzu, it's a little bit comp more complicated because horticulture is a huge industry. And, um, and so it's really difficult. What we're looking for is, is to know ahead of time which species we shouldn't be entering. Uh, but species surprise us all the time in horticulture. So another one um, besides kudzu that was introduced for gardening purposes, for horticultural purposes, is purple loosestrife. And I actually brought an, an example of it with me here. You guys want to look at it after the presentation. Um, and it's a, it's a, you can see why this was brought in for gardens. It's beautiful. It's a really gorgeous plant. It's not native. It's native to Europe. Um, and it grows really fast. And it produces a lot of flowers and a lot of seeds. And it's really hardy. Um, so it's almost the perfect gardening plant, uh, except that it does escape into our natural areas and it's, it's very devastating to wetlands. So it will displace all the other plant species. So what used to be a very diverse plant community in wetlands with cattails and a whole bunch of other plant species is now just purple loosestrife. But more than just displacing the plants, it will displace the animals as well. Um, it has pretty flimsy branches and birds can't nest in it. Um, and a lot of other animals that forage underneath it um, can't really do that as well as they can with the native species. So it really displaces all the plants and all the animals when it invades and you just get a field of purple loosestrife. So it's very environmentally devastating. Um, yet it's a beloved plant by, uh, by many people in horticulture. And um, recently, a, a gra just to show the conflict sometimes between those of us trying to um, keep purple loosestrife and other plants of its kind out and those that want to garden with them. Um, recently, my graduate student, Nick Griffin, found this on the web, which is another species of loosestrife. This one's actually native. Um, and it says, yes, it's back. Um, you can once again grow loosestrife and not be hounded by the eco-Nazis. Um, yeah, which really shows you know, what we're dealing with and, and, the, and the need to, to really communicate well and have public outreach um, and to communicate well with horticulturists because I, I'm, I'm very offended by um, being called an, an eco-Nazi. Um, and, and actually, in terms of this, this, is, this has been brought up a lot by horticulturists that would like to be able to garden with non-native plant species, that we're obsessed right now with nativity, with gardening with native plant species, and that this isn't unlike what happened in Nazi Germany. So there actually is a link to the Nazi party. Um, and that at that time, there was, a, there was a real outbreak of native plant mania um, and a native gardening movement which was founded on nationalistic and racist ideas. Um, and there was even a German landscape architect that uh, led what he called a war of extermination against foreign impatience in Germany at that time. So there was this real drive for native plant species. Um, and is that what we're doing here in this country? Is, and immigration is a very um, important political issue right now. And so are we becoming just really native focused um, 
and, and xenophobic. And I, I would argue no. I think that uh, we are really concerned about invasive plant species and the environmental impact that they're having. I personally uh, don't want to garden with something in my backyard that, unbeknownst to me, might become the next worst um, invasive species like purple loosestrife. I'd rather play it safe and garden with native plants. And I think a lot of people feel the same way. Um, but there is, there is still some res resistance to this. Um, so in terms of gardening with native plants, uh, there's, there's, there's been a lot of people that have really been pushing this, um, including master gardeners um, and master naturalists and a whole bunch of other people at botanical gardens uh, that have been, have been spreading the word about gardening with native plants. And not only is it safer in terms of you're definitely not going to introduce the next um, invasive species that will start in your, in your lawn and then you'll have to live with yourself. Um, but also, uh, these plants are often uh, better for other conservation reasons. They're adapted to live in your home. They're adapted to live in Missouri. So they often don't need to be watered as much. You don't have to use as many pesticides. Um, all of those are, are very good things from a conservation standpoint. So there's a lot of advantages to gardening with native plants. And they're usually very beautiful. You can find some really nice native plant species, including native loosestrife. <laughs> OK, so what about early detection? So this is something that I work um, with the National Park Service. I do a lot of my research on national parks, including um, one in California, Point Reyes National Seashore. And there are a lot of early detection out there. Um, if other places in California are getting um, an invasive species coming in, they want to find it and eradicate it before it has a chance to really establish. And that's just smart. Um, it's also really difficult. Um, it's the best time to, to get rid of an invasive plant or animal species, but it's, the, it's when they're the hardest to find. So what they'll do for us um, researchers at the National Park is they'll get us all together. They'll tell us about the invasive species they're most looking out for, things that they think are coming in and they want us to be on the lookout for. They'll, they'll teach us what they are and give us you know, fat, sort of information sheets about each one. And then um, when we're out doing our, our field work, if we happen to see one of these, we mark the location with our GPS and we tell somebody about it and they go out and kill it. Um, it's really a very good program. Um, and so, it's great that people are doing this amongst themselves. Um, I think all land managers are doing it amongst themselves and people at the park service it. But it, it would be also great if we could get the public involved in this a little bit better um, in the early detection program. And I think some places are really um, getting into this. Uh, a lot of the people that might be the best at early detection are people that are passionate hikers. Uh, these are people that often know their native plants and animals pretty well, and their invasive ones as well. They're able to identify organisms pretty well. Um, and they like hiking around outdoors and looking at stuff. Um, and many of them have portable GPS units. These days, they're getting pretty cute. So to take advantage of these people that might want to help, I think, would really help us with the cause of, of this early detection and basically getting invasive species before they have a chance to really establish and become a problem. <coughs> And then to understand how they succeed. So if you, if you want to eradicate an invasive species, you really have to understand what makes it tick um, and why it's doing so well in the first place. And so this is an example in Australia of an aquatic fern, Salvinia, which you can see uh, really started dominating this waterway. Um, the fern is from Brazil, uh, so it's not native. And it was clogging up the waterway, um, causing huge problems. And so uh, what they found out what, from research was that the reason this fern was doing so well is that it had escaped its enemy, this Brazilian weevil that consumes it in its native range, and that's why it's able to achieve such high abundances in Australia. Um, after very extensive research, because this is very tricky to do, um, they introduced the uh, Brazilian weevil and voila. Um, invasive plant goes extinct and weevil runs out of food and also goes extinct. It's, it's the perfect um, success story for biological control. Um, this, this is very tricky though, um, and, and you have to be careful with this because um, insects may seem very specialized in the lab and you think they're only gonna eat the plant you want them to eat, um, and then you get them out in the field and they perform differently. So it's a very risky thing to bring in a, a yet another alien species to control the first alien species. Um, and there have been disastrous cases. Um, and also, you know, organisms evolve. Um, and there's very strong um, uh, selection pressure for them to be able to eat other things once their first food resource runs out. So, so that happens as well. 
and eradication and restoration. So I'm going to tell you just a little bit about uh, an eradication project that I'm involved in at Point Reyes National Seashore. Uh, one of the worst invasives that they have there is this grass, uh, which is European beach grass. Um, so European beach grass was introduced to California as a sand stabilizer, because if you're going to develop your house right on the sand dune of coastal California, you need to be able to stabilize the sand your house is on, otherwise it'll get washed off to sea. So they brought in this, this grass from Europe, which is a fantastic sand stabilizer, really does the job well. Um, unfortunately, it also spread to areas where it wasn't intended to go, as, as some of these, these organisms do. And it's now um, all over places like our national parks, um, and including Point Reyes National Seashore. And it's, it's very devastating uh, to the native plant species, many of which are endemic to California and very rare to begin with, um, and, and also to our shorebirds, like this very charismatic snowy plover. Um, so what they're doing at Point Reyes and what I've been involved in helping them with is a 300-acre sand dune restoration project. Um, European beach grass is really hard to eradicate because it makes roots that are three meters into the ground. It's got this huge root system. So you can't go out there with a shovel and, and dig it up. Um, you, you have to bring it in. And, and fire doesn't do anything. It just keeps coming back because it's got these roots that are just so deep. And the same with herbicide. It just it seems to be able to survive anything. Um, so what they have to do in order to remove European beach grass is bring in mechanical equipment, basically bring in construction equipment, and dig way under the ground and overturn the sand dune and essentially create a new sand dune um, free of this grass. And so um, they did a pilot uh, of 30 acres, and it was incredibly successful. Um, the grass didn't come back. And um, right away, the birds started nesting that, as soon as the, the habitat was available. And right away, the plants um, started successfully establishing as well. So um, with the amount of, with, with a collaborative effort um, and, and enough money from the National Park Service to complete the job, you really can successfully eradicate some of these invasive species and make a nice habitat for the native species. So I wanted to tell you a little bit about some of Missouri's worst invasive species. And this one was mentioned in terms of Forest Park and all the efforts that have been going on there. This is bush honeysuckle. Um, bush honeysuckle is native to Asia, and it, it's everywhere here. Um, you probably all recognize it, and if you don't, um, uh, you will, because um, it's the first thing that's green as soon as spring starts. It's, it's in probably 75% of your backyards. Um, it's actually, embar I'm embarrassed to say, in my backyard. Um, I bought a house, or I wanted to say, I want to say recently, but it's actually been over a year, um, and haven't eradicated my bush honeysuckle yet. Um, so this plant is actually a really nice shrub cover in many ways. It's really dense, so you don't have to see your neighbor ever. Um, and it grows really fast, and it's really hardy, and it produces these lovely flowers that smell really good, um, and it produces these berries that um, birds like to eat. So it, it seems really great um, in many ways. It is, but unfortunately, it also um, really um, uh, clogs up the forest understory. You can't even walk through a forest that's, that's filled with bush honeysuckle. It displaces native plant species. And um, birds actually really like it and like to nest in it. But once they do nest in it, they become much more vulnerable to having their eggs eaten by uh, squirrels. Uh, so they're almost attracted to it to their own detriment. Uh, so it's, it's actually a pretty devastating um, plant species. And currently, uh, there have been a lot of efforts at Forest Park to get rid of this plant species from Forest Park, which makes a lot of sense, because this is a park we all like to enjoy. We want to be able to walk through the forest and, and see a diversity of native plants and animals in our park. Uh, it's been really a difficult task, though, you can imagine, because there's so much of it in everybody's backyard that surrounds Forest Park that as soon as it's eradicated, there's always new seeds coming in. Um, and the seeds are bird dispersed. The birds eat them, and it comes out the other end. And so it comes out the other end and back in Forest Park. Um, so, so really, we need to, to work as a team, um, as a community, to get rid of this species. Um, Forest Park is a big place, uh, so, so, so it can be successful there to some degree. But it would be really helpful if we could all you know, take, take down our own bush honeysuckle. Uh, Lespedeza cuneata. Lespedeza cuneata is a really interesting plant. It was introduced on purpose um, in 1930 as a roadside uh, erosion control plant um, by the Missouri Department of Transportation. 
this species is native to Asia, and we actually know exactly where this species came from since we brought it over on purpose. It came from Japan. Um, and it is a wonderful roadside stabilizer. It's really good at it. Uh, and unfortunately, also goes into other areas where it's unintended, um, such as old fields and prairies. Uh, so this is, this is basically showing a prairie here that's dominated by the invasive plant Lespedes acuniata. You can see that there's really nothing else there. Um, and this is showing a prairie um, that without the invasive plant, where you get a diversity of native plants um, and native insects and native animals. Um, this, this plant really um, isn't eaten by many of our insects. It gets less than 2% herbivory, so you can imagine there's just not a diversity of life in, in a field with Lespedes acuniata. Um, and this is another plant that I actually brought with me if anybody wants to look at it afterwards, because I think it's really important to know your enemy. Um, so Lespedes acuniata is, is really very difficult to eradicate. It requires um, repeated herbicide treatments um, in particular to, to get rid of it finally. Um, a, a, a local organization that's been really working to do this is the Missouri Prairie Foundation, um, where they basically will try to preserve prairies that are already intact, but they also take prairies that are degraded um, with species like Lespedes acuniata and aim to restore them, to remove the Lespedes acuniata and to bring back the natural diversity. So this is an organization that I'm a member of, um, and if you're interested, I brought some information about them. So when you're looking at the Lespedes. Um, and then uh, um, another one that's really terrible um, is garlic mustard. Uh, so garlic mustard is in the mustard family, and if you crunch up the leaves, it smells and tastes a lot like garlic. Uh, it was actually brought over on purpose as well as a herb, um, but it, it's really not used as an herb, and I don't, I don't know that there's any evidence that it ever really has successfully been used as an herb. So it was brought over here on purpose, but hasn't really served any function. Um, what it does instead is it invades forests. Um, and you can see how dense it can get in the forest understory. So it displaces all of the beautiful spring ephemeral plants that we love to look at um, in the springtime, which is coming up very soon. And also it, it poses a, an economic threat to forestry because uh, tree seedlings can't regenerate in a, a forest filled with garlic mustard. So it's a very devastating plant and it, and it, it reproduces and spreads at, at really um, alarming rates. So I'm going to talk a little bit more about this plant because it's been a topic of some of the research in my, in my lab at, at Washington University. And so this is what the plant will look like probably in a couple of weeks. And I brought one with me, and it doesn't look that impressive um, right now. It doesn't look as, as beastly as it will be in, in a few weeks, but you can see it anyway. I brought the garlic mustard with me. This is what it's going to look like in a few weeks. You'll see this is a, a, a second-year plant. It's a rosette. It's going to bolt and flower this year. And you'll see these little garlic mustard seedlings in the understory. Um, so this is what a forest will look like that has garlic mustard very soon. And so just a little bit more details about garlic mustard. Garlic mustard is um, in, the, in the mustard family, in the Brassicaceae. It's a Laria petiolata. Um, it's native to Europe and has a very wide distribution in Europe. Um, and and why, is it, why is it so nasty here? Why is it so invasive? It's something we've thought a lot about. Um, it definitely seems to have a lack of herbivores in the United States. Um, we don't see much eating it. We don't see very many diseases on it. The plants usually look really healthy, um, and the leaves look untouched. Um, and so what I have here is a picture of Britta Teller, who's uh, an undergraduate researcher in my lab. And, there, and she's actually on a family trip to Europe um, in this picture. And so there's sort of two things I want you to notice about this picture. One is that um, she's, sitting here with, she's sitting here with garlic mustard, so, so the first thing I want you to notice is that she's a real big plant nerd um, who's on her vacation with her family looking at garlic mustard. Um, and this is the, she was very excited to see it because this is garlic mustard in its native range, and she had never seen it in its native range, only in the invasive range. And so the other thing I want you to notice about this garlic mustard plant is it looks terrible. It's, um, it's kind of yellowing, and, and it looks kind of small and, and wimpy. Um, they never look like that here. Uh, they always look like healthy, hardy, untouched plants. Um, so it does seem like in Europe, um, they're, they're getting some, some uh, they're having more trouble uh, with the enemies. Um, so is it evolutionary novel in the USA? I mean, sort of. It's not, it's not like a snake in Guam, which is the only snake on the whole island. Um, it's, it's in the mustard family. There's a lot of mustards here. Uh, in the United States, we have a lot of plants in the Brassicaceae family, but it is the only one in its genus. 
Um, it's the only Aliaria in the area. So it is, it is a bit unique in some ways. And it seems to have traits that are, that are pretty unique to it and probably allow it to be invasive that are stronger than some of the other mustard um, species. So it's allelopathic, which essentially means that it has a really strong chemicals in its roots that it exudes into the soil. And so um, this is, is, can be very adaptive because it, it keeps it from um, getting harmed by fungal pathogens. But also, uh, it's a nice competitive strategy because it's essentially zapping other plants next to it with its chemicals. Um, and native plants can't really do that as well. Um, so that's certainly something that gives it a nice competitive edge. Um, it's able to self-fertilize. It doesn't need pollinators at all. It can just readily set seed, mate with itself. Um, it has a rapid life cycle. It can go through its whole life cycle in two years. Um, and at the end of that life cycle, it can produce up to 3,500 seeds in, from one plant. So that's a lot. Um, and um, to top it all off, some of those seeds will germinate right away, but some of them will stay in the seed bank so that the garlic mustard is essentially there forever once it establishes. Um, so how can we understand garlic mustard and use that understanding to get rid of it? Um, and, that's, and that's really our goal. So what we've been doing is creating a model to describe garlic mustard's population dynamics. And so um, what we have here is just a life cycle graph. Um, this is seeds in the seed bank. Um, these are the first year plants, which are rosettes or seedlings, um, and then adults. And the arrows show basically the demographics, probability of surviving and going to the next stage class, um, and probability that adults will, will produce seeds that will either germinate right away or go into the seed bank. Probability that seeds will germinate out of the seed bank. Um, so we have a model that takes into account this really simple life cycle, this stage structure. But we also incorporate into our model competition. Um, because these garlic mustard plants, as it turns out, compete really strongly with one another, and that's very important to their population dynamics. And um, we take into account their dispersal ability, because that's certainly going to affect the rate at which they can move into a habitat. So garlic mustard um, experiences really strong competition with itself. Uh, so, and this is, I could show you all the experimental data we have that, that proves this, but you can really see it pretty easily just from a picture. Um, this is my collaborator, Eleanor Pardini, and she is holding a single garlic mustard plant. This one plant. Um, and she collected it in an area where there was no other garlic mustard plants around it. And that plant is enormous. Um, it's, it's practically a bush. It's got multiple branches, and, and this is one of the ones that would have about 3,500 seeds. Um, and then you can take a plant like this one right here um, from an area where there's lots of other garlic mustard plants surrounding it, so where there's very strong competition. This is a really puny plant, has one stalk, um, will make much fewer seeds. So, so definitely a really strong competition. They do worse um, when they're surrounded by each other. Um, so what about their dispersal ability? Actually, they're not that good at it. Um, uh, this is a picture of garlic mustard seeds. And um, what you can see here is that there's no obvious adaptation for things like wind dispersal. Um, they don't have wings or anything that's going to make them be carried away by wind. Um, they're also, neither the seeds nor the fruits are sticky. They don't stick to animals or, or your shoes or anything else. So they don't really have any obvious dispersal adaptations. They're just little mustard seeds that kind of fall right next to the parent plant. Occasionally, they get moved um, a bit further than just right next to their, their mom. Um, and the way that we think that's happening is uh, they get into the mud. They're very small seeds. The mud gets on car tires or on hiking boots or um, perhaps on deer hooves and moves around that way. So most of the seeds don't go very far, but occasionally you get one that can go, can go pretty far. And so if we take all this information and say, well, what do we expect the garlic mustard to do through time? And that's what I did here with this model. And so what you can see is time here um, from year zero, the start date, to year 50. So I'm projecting 50 years into the future. And then the density of garlic mustard here. And it's, it's really interesting because the garlic mustard are really expected to go up and down through time. Um, and we really do see this in the field too. You have pulse years and then years that are slightly less and then pulse years and years that are slightly less. Um, I mean, they never, well, the reason they go up in a pulse year is because these plants are able to have really, really high fertility. They're able to make a lot of seeds. Um, and so, and then the next year there's just a ton more. Um, but because there's strong competition, uh, they'll go down. But they'll never go down so far that they're going to go, they're going to even be at a slight risk of extinction. I mean, if you look at the scale here, here the 10,000 
thousand is the is the max, which this is for a meter squared. Uh, so that's just a lot of seeds making that up. So they, they fluctuate, but they're, mas they're basically staying really, really dense the whole time. Um, so then we can ask with our model, like, okay, this is looking at garlic mustard through time if we do nothing to it, if we just let it do what it's capable of doing. What if we induced mortality? What if we killed adult plants? We went out there and pulled them. What would, how many would we have to pull in order to drive garlic mustard extinct? Because that's our goal. And according to our model, 95%. We have to kill 95% of the adult plants every single year. Um, and so if anybody's ever tried to kill 95% of the, the adult garlic mustard in a population, it's, it's really difficult to do um, for a lot of reasons. One is that usually the populations are pretty big, and that would be a huge, huge effort in terms of time. Um, but the other reason is that the garlic mustard are actually surprisingly easy to miss um, when you're going through and pulling them. Um, some of them are really, really small, and so you'll miss them entirely. And also, if you don't get the entire root, they can re-sprout. Um, so if you're, if you're pulling them out of the ground or using other methods like herbicide, if you're not completely effective at killing all of the, the above ground biomass, um, they'll, they'll just come back. So it's really hard to get a 95% mortality rate. Um, so, so what do we do? And, and this is a study site that um, we've been working on quite a bit. And this is Tyson Research Center. And Tyson Research Center is a field station owned by Washington University, and it's about 20 miles west of here. If you take I-44 towards Eureka, but you don't get to Eureka, and this is actually I-44 right here. Um, and this, this, we estimate that this garlic mustard probably arrived here in the year 2000, um, though we can't be exactly sure. Uh, and we also suspect that it started right here. And um, and not to, not to point fingers, um, but we think that what happened was there's sort of a parking area for the Missouri Department of Transportation right there, and that it might have come in on the wheels of those um, road trucks from other parks and other places they were at nearby. So we got the initial um, immigrants of, of garlic mustard, and then you can see it's just really spread um, uh, through this site. This is, this is a huge site. This is, this is 2,000 acres that's being shown here. So. Um, um, and there's quite a, quite a large infestation right here and then right here. And you can sort of see, too, that as, as uh, researchers that use this site, we have this little roadway that's sort of right here. And you can see that we've probably moved the garlic mustard with us along our, along our path. Um, and then what's also really interesting is that we've got these isolated satellite in, um, populations way up here. Um, and these are really fascinating because these are those rare long-distance dispersal events um, which led to these satellite populations. And some of them, like this guy right here, um, it's only a few plants, they're all by themselves, and there's nothing else, no other garlic mustard within 500 meters. So these would be really easy to miss if you weren't really looking for them. Um, and I'll just show you what that satellite population looks like. And this is that little blue dot on the map. See this little ring of garlic mustard right here? Um, so yeah, what we think happened was this was probably, there was one single plant that established here, and these are all of its offspring um, that fell like right next to the, the one parent plant. Um, so you see you get like this little satellite population here. And because these individuals are still not all that crowded, they're having really high growth and fertility, um, really high seed production. So these satellite individuals are able to really do very well. And so what we've been doing, um, what we've been doing at Tyson is, is taking our model into account and making a management plan that really makes sense for this species. And one thing to do um, right off the bat is to basically take out these satellite populations first, right? Because these individuals, first of all, are located in a great location in, in terms of if you don't get them now, they're just going to keep getting bigger and they're, and they're going to allow this plant to spread over the whole site. Um, and we, of course, don't want that. So we take these out first, and we try to be 100% effective. Um, we're really, really careful with these, because we know we have to be at least 95% effective to have an impact. And we want to be 100% effective um, for these guys. And then we start going in. We get, we get these guys and this one, and we sort of move in to, to where the center of the infestation is um, and kill as many as we can, as many as time is available. Um, and and that another good reason to take out these little guys is each one of those plants, because it's so isolated, is capable of producing 3,500 seeds. Whereas these guys um, are not capable. They're capable of producing a mere 350 seeds. 
Um, so they're producing much fewer seeds. The other, the other thing is um, that if you were to go in here and you were to um, really focus your energy here, uh, you have to be at least 95% effective in order to have any effect, any real effect. If you're, say, 90% effective and 10% of the plants remain, um, basically those 10% of the plants are going to be, are going to have much higher survivorship and much higher seed production because you've removed all their competitors, right? So they basically compensate for what you just did and make it as if you did almost nothing. Um, so, so this is the type of things that our model is telling us and, and it's really informed our management. And I think a lot of, of land managers really have this satellite um, view. You know, they know that they need to really go after these. It's as if you're controlling a spreading fire. You, of course, want to work from the outside in. But there's also this sort of psychological thing that goes with invasive plant management, which is if you have like a team of volunteers, it's very tempting to take that team of volunteers, you know, everybody's like, yeah, I want to kill garlic mustard, um, to go where all the garlic mustard is, where you can really feel like you're doing something, you know, you're, you're, you're pulling all this garlic mustard. But actually your time might be better spent, you know, carefully, you know, working from the outside in. Um, and so it's, it's just something that we think um, it, we really want to push. And, and speaking of which, we're not just working at the Tyson, Tyson Research Center, which is right here. Um, we're working at five other sites as well that are owned by the Missouri Department of Conservation and by the Missouri uh, County Park System. And, and so it's really been a, a collaborative effort um, between all of us. And just to, this is the Mississippi River, St. Louis. Um, here's Tyson. And then these are our other field sites. There's actually six total, and all of them have in common that they have recent infestations of garlic mustard. Um, so there's Tyson, and then um, Howell Island, Darst Bottoms, Klondike Park, Little Lost Creek. Might have heard of some of these places. And so what we're doing at all of these sites is, um, is managing garlic mustard by pulling it, um, and we, we do 50 hours of management at each site. And this is what it looks like. Um, when we get through with an area, we'll get a pile of dead garlic mustard. And sometimes, uh, with, the Missouri, with the help of the Missouri Department of Conservation, we get to set the garlic mustard on fire, which is always a crowd pleaser. Um, so, and that's really, it's really important to, to make sure it's dead. Um, and, but importantly, for the, for the sake of the science, we're monitoring how effective we are. So we're, we're going back every year and um, we know exactly where this garlic mustard was the year before. We know um, how many we killed and we're seeing how big the population is in future years. To look to see if our techniques are working to, to, to seriously reduce the abundance and distribution of garlic mustard or if we need to revise if it's not working the way our model would predict. So we're really testing our model with this management. And so I just want to conclude that um, alien invasions are an irreversible loss of the biotic uniqueness and integrity once present on each and every continent, and that our natural heritage is really at stake here. And that managing invasive species really needs to be a cooperative effort between academics, land managers, and the public. And to quote an old proverb, um, an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. So with that, I'm happy to, to take any questions. Yeah, in the white shirt. No, I cannot. <laughs> um, I, I haven't heard that that story, but um, it's it sounds familiar. So yeah, I w I, it wouldn't be a story that would surprise me. Yes. That is a great question. Um, and it, uh, in case you didn't hear it, 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 can plants like garlic mustard be eradicated through control burns of the forest? It's, it's hard to say. I actually suspect, I, I think that there's not enough research available that really is conclusive. 
Um, people have tried it, and some have been successful, and some haven't. And there's not any real explanation for why the successful ones were successful and the unsuccessful ones weren't. It could have been due to the timing of the fire, um, the time of year that it happened. I, I tend to think it could be successful with garlic mustard. The seed bank is pretty shallow, um, as is the root system of the, of the plants. Um, and I think combined, especially with other management techniques, it might be something that, that would really be successful. But it's, it, the verdict is still out on that one. Yeah. Yes. Okay. So the question is, why not uh, zap bush honeysuckle with Roundup when it's the only thing in town because it's one of the first thing that's that's green in the spring? And actually, the answer is that often that can really work. Um, and the same is true with garlic mustard. It's one of the first things that's really up in the spring. Um, and so it's a good chance to sort of get it while it's the only game in town, and you're going to have the least impact on some of the native plant species. Um, and and some people like Bruce Schutte at Craver River, I know, has had some really good success with that. Um, and, but, you know, he's told me that some years it's more successful than others. And that if the temperature has to be, like, you really, there's a very brief window um, where you can really get at the, it's warm enough and you can just get at the invasive species and not hurt the native species because they're not up yet. So you've got a quick window. And it has to be warm enough that the plant is photosynthesizing actively. Because um, if they're not, they're not going to soak up the chemicals. Uh, so sometimes it works really well and sometimes it doesn't. Um, but it can, it can work beautifully. Yeah, in the back. No, you definitely don't want to tell people to set it on fire. Um, so what do you do with garlic mustard after you kill it? Um, I, I, something we're experimenting with this year is um, basically killing it and then putting some herbicide on it, too. Um, because most of the time, we, and we've looked at this, most of the time when you, when you pull it out of the ground and you put it in a bag, um, it's, it's done for. It's not going to make it. Um, the, the seeds aren't going to mature, and if they do, those seeds aren't, aren't going to be aren't going to be able to germinate. But sometimes, um, depending on the timing that you do it, time of year, you can get it well. If, if you get it while the fruits are green and they're not quite ripe, those seeds will absolutely mature. So you have to dispose of the, you have to get rid of the plant, or you're basically going to have thousands and thousands of garlic mustard seeds. We're, we're experimenting with um, well, first timing. Of the, the earlier you can get out there and do it, the better. Or if you can get the plants while they're in flower and they haven't fruited yet it's very unlikely that they're going to um, set seed for you once you've killed them. Um, but if you can't do that, then um, I think if you put them in a bag and you put herbicide in there, it will work. But we're not sure yet. That's a great question. And I actually don't have a good answer for it. I think that's a really important problem. Yeah. And so 
so I'm trying to figure out the disinvasive doing any health, and uh, because that's an argument, that sure. it's, it's a good economic source for the Malagasy, plus maybe it's benefiting some endangered species. Um, we have the same thing in another reserve <coughs> Right. So that's a, I mean, that's a really good question. Um, so with bush honeysuckle, I can say we're, we're pretty sure we don't know um, how it produces millions and millions of fruit every year and what impact that has had on the bird community structure. And if removing the honeysuckle might do some harm to some of those birds, I think, I think we're not sure. Um, it, in many ways, um, I've presented a lot of the easier stories here. Um, where most of the invasive species I've shown you have no beneficial effects. Um, but sometimes, especially with invasive species that aren't as noxious or as invasive, um, they have a more complicated role in the community, and, and that really needs to be investigated before they're, before they're managed. Um, so I'd, I'd have to look into it further, but that's my thoughts on that for, for now. It, it is a more complicated issue than I presented. Um, and actually, uh, a collaborator of mine has a paper that's coming out just on that topic um, with, uh, with basically that you have to have not just one species in mind for your plant management and that you have to have the goal of, of removing all of the invasive plant species in the community. Otherwise, you absolutely get that. You remove bush honeysuckle and garlic mustard comes in. Um, so, so yeah, that's, that's absolutely true. You, you really have to have a multi-species approach. Yeah. Um, with the garlic mustard, have they um, done any studies to see if the allelopathic or the phytotoxins um, that they produce and put into the soil, if they remain in the soil over a period of time? That's a great question, because a study just came out on that. Um, so the question was, how long what's the half-life of these chemicals that garlic mustard exudes into the soil? So a study just came out that basically sa said that garlic mustard exudes these allelopathic chemicals into the soil, which can kill um, beneficial soil fungus, like the mycorrhizae, um, which native plants need a lot for their uh, resource acquisition. Uh, so they, they kill all these sort of beneficial soil biota, and um, the half-life is incredibly long. So they, they had a site where they removed garlic mustard and then waited 20 years and um, tried to establish native plants and to get um, and looked at the mycorrhizal community on those native plants and it was completely depauperate still and they tried to add mycorrhizal fungi to the soil and it died like they couldn't get it to reestablish and the, and it was because all of the little chemicals were still in the soil and so one thing that we're really curious about is in Europe where this plant is native if there's soil biota that breaks down these allelo chemicals, and those biota are not here. So there's just nothing in our native soils that's breaking down these chemicals, which is why they're able to stay in the soil for so long. So I think that's a really, and we don't know the answer to that, I think that's a really interesting line of inquiry. So our results are really new. Um, we haven't published them yet. Uh, so 
So none of them have been distributed yet. But we're funded by the United States Department of Agriculture. And part of our agreement is to make sure that this information gets distributed not just to academics, but to um, agroforesters and other, other people, other land managers that might be able to use it. So um, we're looking for advice on how to tap into those avenues. Um, so yeah, thanks. Yeah. I don't know if there's a furnace to burn garlic mustard. We have had to put a lot of gasoline on it to really get it to burn. Um, so it, it's actually pretty hard to get it to burn. Um, That's why we're backing it. Yeah. I think that's a great idea. I think that it's something that, in terms of making it a cooperative effort um, between everyone, to have a website that gives people instructions on what to do with their garlic mustard and where to take it, and to have maybe one site where it's being burned up is would be fantastic. Um, but I, as far as I know, there's nothing like that available right now. Yeah. Is burning it really that critical, or is high temperature that critical? It seems to me with some plants you could actually put, put them in these black plastic bags you put them out in the sun, anywhere here, mm -hmm. that's about like, the temperature's going to be 180 degrees inside those bags. I was wondering if that, that in itself would just kill the plants and uh, destroy the seeds. Yep, we've done that too. Um, in, in places where we, it would, it would be really hard to haul the plants out, but there's a nice gap opening in the forest. Because you, you leave them in the forest and it's, it's kind of nice and shady and cool under there and, and they can, and the, the seeds can continue to develop, the fruit pods can continue to develop. You put them out in the open sun, um, they will fry to death. So yeah, that works. But we, we go back and make sure. Um, so yeah. Um, do you know the current status on gypsy moth? The current status on gypsy moth, it's terrible. Um, no, I don't. Uh, what specifically? Yeah, I don't know. I don't know the current status on it, but that has been one of the. If you look at the United States' worst invasive species, that's that's probably in the top ten. So, yeah, it's 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 a terrible one. So one thing I forgot to mention is that if you're interested in getting involved with invasive species research or management with the Missouri Department of Conservation or, or with our garlic mustard program, I have a sign-up sheet um, for anyone who's interested up here with, the, with these beautiful plants that, that you have to get to know um, and get to hate. <laughs> so, so just, yeah, let me know. Uh, yeah. Um, no, because we haven't looked at it in different forest types. We've been trying to keep all of our sites consistent for experimental reasons. But I have heard over in Illinois that it does better with buckthorn. So that's, that's something that I think is interesting to think about. Uh, I think it does perform differently in different environments. Yeah. Thank you.